know we have guests here today, but uh, looking forward to a wonderful day. And I'd ask that if everybody would turn off their cell phone or put it on silent as we get going here. All right. And the first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to have Dalen, who is our greeter today, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to pull up the flag here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And the four way test of all the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And the fifth one, will it be fun? Oh, All right, please be seated. And I will invite Dale up to give us our invocation. Well, I was in the process of cleaning up my desk, and all of a sudden I came across a story that I've spoken about before. It's called Friends on the Journey of Life. Yeah, yeah. The story is called Friends on the Journey of Life. At birth, we're boarded the train and met our parents, and we believe they will always travel at our side. However, at some station, our parents will step down from the train, leaving us on the journey alone. As time goes on, other people will board the train, and they will be significant. For example, siblings, friends, children, grandchildren, and even the love of your life. Many may step down and leave a permanent vacuum. Others will go unnoticed that they don't realize that they vacated their seats. This train ride will be full of joy, sorrow, fantasy, expectations, hopes, goodbyes, and farewells. Success continues consists rather of having good relationship with all passengers requiring that we give the best of ourselves. The mystery is this, we do not know at which station we ourselves will step down. So we must live the best way, love, forget, and offer the best of who we are. It's important to do this because when the time comes for us to step down and leave our seat empty, we should leave behind beautiful memories for those who continue to travel the train of life. I wish everyone a joyful journey on the train of life. Reap success, get lots of love, help out in rotary, and more importantly, thank God for this journey. Thank you, Dale. All right. So next, we've got a couple um, announcements today. So I want to call Jerry up first. If you give us a Finish chewing on your way up here and then tell us <laughs> all about uh, the day's rose Okay, Cap. I think you know what we're going to talk about. And if you don't, then you haven't been around much. We're going to talk about a little bit about um, taste of rose fest, just very quickly. This isn't the big introduction here, but there's been a lot of work that's been going on with Kathy and the board about. Uh, putting some sense to our numbers over the years, and I just wanted to share that with you. So this is the taste. Um, next one, please. I just had to start with this picture. It kind of is tells the story of the last few years here of not having, uh, being able to do it. Uh, we wanted to do it. We have been able to do it, and we've decided we're going to do it this year, and we're going to go for it. We think it's all right. So the next one, this is what I really want to talk about. From 2010 to 2021, okay, those are important dates there, we have raised and given away 395000 odd dollars. Um, you can see how it's broken down, and I know you probably can't read it in the back there because it's a little small. The blue is community grants, which is the money that we've given away just within Roseville. The gray is international grants, money that we have given away that has gone outside the borders. And the orange is support for other Rotary clubs where they ask us to join them and we match that. So 74%, 74 cents in every dollar that we've raised has gone to Roseville, okay? Now, before you go to the next one, 2010 to 2021, we don't have 2022 there yet because how we work this is, and this is the board's doing, 
The money we raise in one year, we give out the next year. So we're also sitting on some money that's accumulated over the last few years. And if I'm not mistaken, it's right around 80,000. 20 of that is the, what we need for seed money for this year's event, because that's basically what it costs us for expenses. The other part, the board is holding on to until we get to a point where we decide what are we gonna do with it. So we'll add to this year's, but we've got about $60,000 to put out this year, okay? So really that 395 figure is like more 480. Okay. Okay. Next slide. Quickly, this is how it breaks down. And I think this is just very interesting here. It shows our priorities as a club. The blue is basic education, about just a little over half goes for basic education. The next big one is supporting the environment, which is the green. Blue is peace and conflict. Yellow is maternal and child health. Gray is economic and community development. And the orange is disease prevention. And if you notice those, those match the seven priorities of Rotary. The one that's missing is water. We don't do anything with water specifically with this club. You were going to ask a question? I was going to ask you where those things, those topics came from, but you had. Yep. Okay. 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 So again, just trying to give you a sense where the money's going here. We're hoping to add to it. Final one, please. Next one. This is what we're using these days as we begin to introduce and talk to new partners about what is Roseville Rotary and the Taste of Rose Fest about. And these four guiding principles really help us understand this is more than just eating some food that restaurants put on our plate with a little glass of wine, okay? Uh, <laughs> partnership is huge. I won't get into it a lot, but the best example of that is what we did was support our restaurants last year, where we went out and bought gift certificates and then auctioned them off. And it was amazing. It was amazing when I went to restaurants and said, we'd like to purchase. And I remember one in particular said, well, I'm sorry, we're going to have to talk to corporate about that. Now, no, I don't think you're understanding. I want to buy it, and I want you to tell me what is the right amount. It blew them away. And we've already had restaurants back then that said, so when is the next year's event? When, when do we get going? So it was a good thing for them of being a partnership with restaurants that have supported us, but it was also an investment in this year. Community is the whole piece about just coming together. And for those of you that have been at this, if you ever haven't, please do come. Um, it is just a wonderful community event. And everybody that I talk to talks about this is a premier event for Roseville. Stewardship environment is the biggest way that we do stewardship. And we don't have to talk a lot about it, but 95%, 99%, David? 95%. 95% of all the garbage that is generated that day is recycled or composted. <laughs> Think of all the bags of plates and food and whatever. And if we could find some way to get the plastic tablecloths to be recycled, we'd be at 100%. That's what the 5% is. And then finally, quality. And this is huge. This is huge. This is not just put on by some volunteers doing something. Last year, and I'm going to put it on David's shoulders again, when we were trying to decide whether we were going to go forward with it or not, and we weren't quite sure about where COVID was and all, and David said, you know, I don't think we can ensure that we're going to have a quality event. And everybody said, you're right, we can't. And that's why we postponed it last year. And good thing we did because then COVID really went crazy. So just to leave this image in your mind, last one. This is what we hope to get back to rather than empty, okay? Um, of people coming together. And the challenge that I'm gonna to put to you is if you look at this picture, you can see some faces of some people that are no longer with us. And that's one of the things that we're doing and I will talk more about another point. We are reaching out to other non other service project service groups in the area right now, most notably Optimist. And thank you, I talked with Ken today, okay? And saying, how can we come together and join forces to be able to provide the best outdoor summer event in Roseville on the third Thursday in June? And they're looking to join us. So you'll hear more about it, but just keep going folks, we're getting ready. Any quick questions before I sit down? What was the date of that meeting at the end then? I think it was like June 23rd. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> a plan. Okay, okay. We'll get more later. Just it's coming. Oh, and so you're gonna hear about auctions. The letters for sponsorships are coming out. We're contacting restaurants with Jim's help. We've got a new contact with a, a liquor store that's gonna help us all. Know. A little Venetian is gonna help us. With, I mean, things are coming together here very quickly. So um, we'll talk more in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Love your enthusiasm, and there's as much or more of that enthusiasm when we both get together on the 23rd. So lots of fun there. Um, David, you want to come up and share a few updates about our community service? 
Uh, sure, we have uh, two opportunities still going on. Now we have uh, every meal at Brim Hall. We have basically five more sets, five more distributions to do, four in May and one in June, and they're, they're pretty wide open. So if you want to try it, it's your last chance. There's five more times so, to hand out meals, equipment backpacks for students to take home for the weekend. And our other one is um, Snelling Avenue. We're going to clean up the road on May 7th, I believe it is, on Saturday from 9 to noon. We already have seven signed up, so we have a, we have a, a number, but we want to use more. So if you're interested in helping us out on that day, there's sign-up sheets for both of those up here, or you can sign up uh, on Sign Up Genius. It was in the uh, invite to the meeting today. So thanks. All right, so now I'm going to introduce our program for today, uh, Dr. Chad Weinstein. And uh, kind of a funny story, we met about in 2014, I think it was, uh, when I was in Leadership St. Paul, the best class ever. And <laughs> Julie knows that. Um, but you never know when your connections will circle back around. So I reached back out to him and he said, absolutely, I'd love to come to you. So Chad is the founder and president of Ethical Leaders in Action. He provides leadership development, strategic consulting to organizations for the nonprofit, for-profit, and also the public sectors. Prior to establishing Ethical Leaders in Action, he founded, or he founded the Hill Center for Ethical Business Leadership, a division of the James J. Hill Library. So Chad, welcome to this. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, and it, it really, truly is a privilege to be here. Make sure we're working. I always try to say yes to Rotary. Um, first of all, you are people who, who <laughs> demonstrate by your actions a deep commitment to precisely the perspective on ethics that I want to talk about today, because uh, as a professional ethicist, I am not always warmly received. <laughs> a little bit like saying I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. But unlike our brothers and sisters in public service, and I make that very clear, unlike that, and it looks like, uh, unlike that, of those folks, um, we ethicists kind of deserve it. We have created an environment where when we take the enterprise of ethics out of its academic roots and into the workplace, we become excessively focused on thou shalt not. We become excessively focused on mitigating behavior that isn't quite criminal, but it isn't quite acceptable. And there's room to do that. I mean, it is true that there is rotten behavior and we ought to mitigate it. But first of all, I haven't been very successful at that. I have never stopped a scumbag from an act of scumbaggery. <laughs> but more than that, our ethical traditions don't merely lead us to not be rotten. They also can lead us to be our best. I mean, if conduct can be dastardly or questionable or dubious, it can also be acceptable and honorable and even heroic and express the best of us as human beings, individually and especially in community. And that's what my business is dedicated to. It's dedicated to helping ethical leaders make the world a little bit better place. And it's dedicated to using ethical principles to help people to perform better at whatever they're doing. Because it turns out that if you act honorably, people tend to trust you. And if people tend to trust you, they're more likely to follow you and they're more likely to do business with you and they're more likely to engage with you and doing things together. There's a lot of power in that. I have the privilege of working across contexts, and I'll tell you a little about that in a moment. But for too many years, and Jenny, you might have heard this before, I think 2014 is a little before this happened to me. Um, I'm still talking about it though. One random early summer day, back when it was sunny this time of year, um, I went to pick up my son at his elementary school and I walked by the playground on the way into the school. And I walked by the monkey bars. And under the monkey bars, there was a little boy about my son's age. He was about six. This little boy was pudgy. He was bespectacled. He looked to be East African. I found out his name was Mohammed. And Mohammed 
was crying hard, standing under these monkey bars, just sobbing. And I look and I pause and I see another kid, a wiry blonde kid about the same age named Chris. And I'm watching Chris move around the, the playground and I hear this, 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 Mohammed, this, 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 Mohammed, this, 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 Mohammed. And I'm pretty sure that what I'm watching is playground bullying and possible racial overtones. And I'm realistic. I don't think we're gonna stop playground bullying in our time. And at the same time, I'm a dad. And this may shock you, I was once a pudgy, bespectacled kid. It's hard to imagine, but it's true. <laughs> so I feel like I have some skin in the game. And I stand off to the side and I watch. What I saw surprised me. Chris came around the back of the playground with four of his little buddies in tow. Mohammed had stopped crying by this point. He, had, he was in that, that little kid post-cry stage that uh, uh, quite sad and Chris marches up to Mohammed and he says Mohammed come on man you can do it you can do it jump man you can do it get up on those monkey bars come on man jump get on the bars you can do it and so Mohammed tried to jump and he he jumped and he jumped and he could not get air and Chris and his little buddies with Mohammed's kind of surprise, non-verbal consent, got around him and grabbed him by his chubby little thighs and lifted him up. And Mohammed grabbed the monkey bars. And he's hanging. And then they start screaming. These kids are like, come on, Mohammed, swing. Well, it was more a fibrillation than a swing. <laughs> he couldn't quite get it going. And so they grabbed him again. And they moved his legs until Mohammed got rolling and Mohammed found the courage to grab that next bar and then the same bar. And he did that a couple of times. And in the time it took me to grab my kid, Mohammed had mastered the monkey bars. And his face told the story. This kid was a light. And I learned something that day. I learned a couple things. First thing I learned, Look how quickly I jumped to conclusions. Look how negative those conclusions were and look how wrong I was, right? Now, as leaders, we need to be decisive sometimes. But even when we need to be decisive, can we also be curious? Can we also be humble enough to accept the idea that maybe what we think we see isn't the whole story? Can we keep our minds open, even as we're acting, to also be curious and perceptive? That was the first lesson. Second one was bigger. These kids didn't help Mohammed because there was a big test and they wanted extra credit. They didn't help Mohammed because there was a promotion and they wanted the job. These kids helped Mohammed because they knew in their hearts there was a simple joy in doing so. There was, in this case, literally a simple joy in lifting a brother up. And in this instance, in this instance, I, I reflect on my career and my life, and I can think of constant, countless instances where I have been lifted up, and I can think of instances where others, brothers and sisters, have lifted each other up, and I can also think of the opposite, and I'm sure you can too, both. The time when you saw, when you watch someone, when someone watches another person fail, might take pleasure in it, maybe keeps the email evidence in the back pocket in case they need it, right? Maybe puts rocks in their pocket to slow them down. And these are all human instincts. And I take the lesson from these kids that we are making choices. And can we make those choices about the simple pleasure and goodness of lifting one another up? These days, I do my work in multiple contexts. Before I started the Hill Center that became Ethical Leaders in Action, I did consulting in market and technology for large companies. I helped, I pulled teams of experts together and helped them make decisions. And it was fascinating. Didn't do much for my heart, but I learned a lot. And I had the opportunity to focus on this positive perspective on ethics and took it and began doing this work full-time in 07. I stayed with the corporate kinds of clients that I had always worked with, 
And I was looking for business clients when someone said, you ought to talk to Rotary Clubs. And I said, Rotary Clubs? I mean, I've seen the logo, right? <laughs> um, and I have, I've never said no to a Rotary Club if I could help it because um, through Rotary, um, I met two of the key business partners that have helped me succeed. Through Rotary, turns out that local police chiefs and fire chiefs and sheriffs tend to be members of their local Rotary Club. About 70% of my work is in public safety, police, fire, and EMS. And that started because a fire chief in Eden Prairie and a police chief in St. Paul came up to me and said, hey, do you work with our organization? And I was once an eight-year-old boy, so that was fairly compelling on that basis. I also knew as a long-time consultant that you got to get to know the environment, that if you're going to work with a group of people, you need to learn their world. And so I have been a student of public safety for the last 14 years or so and continue to do now the majority of my work. That has spread to working with cities. And I have a relationship with the League of Minnesota Cities and sometimes a relationship with the League of Minnesota Townships and have helped their boards solve problems and work together more effectively, have helped a number of city councils with strategic planning and relationship building and city staff and so forth. And I never forget how fortunate I am. And those relationships more than any other single place started in a room like this. And so it is, it is with great gratitude that I have the opportunity to speak to you today. I also do a pro bono project, Maple, uh, Rotary Club of Maple Grove does an ethics day for high school students and I teach for them every year, more than 10 years now. It's a wonderful thing. And then, you know, those high school students restore our faith in humanity. You know, if we open our hearts to it, it's a pretty amazing experience. Um, this is a hard time. This is the hardest time since I've been doing this work and since I can remember to do this work. Because overwhelmingly, we are picking sides as a society and it's not healthy and it's not safe and it terrifies me, to be perfectly honest. And it doesn't matter which side you're on, it terrifies me. It terrifies me because what has become, what began as community, affiliation of people to support one another has too often become a focus of um, supporting one another in opposition to them over there. And I use the term tribalism. I'm following David Brooks and others. I'm sensitive to the term because there are Native American tribes. There's a very healthy and rich tradition of tribes. And I don't mean to be confused with that in any way. But what, what David Brooks and others mean by tribalism is the transition from mutual support to mutual opposition to another group. And when the purpose of our connection becomes thwarting that other group, some terrible things happen. First of all, we can't cooperate anymore because that's giving aid and comfort to the enemy. And second of all, we start to establish rules as we've seen many times in human history. Are you really part of my group? I mean, here's the list of beliefs that you need to subscribe to for me to trust you. And that's really dangerous, really, really dangerous. And so my strong hope is that some of the work that I do contributes to breaking down, to diminishing, maybe to slowing, maybe to reversing this tragic, horrible trend. And I want, I focus my work a lot these days. I do a lot of traditional ethics training. I do a lot of team development, working with groups of teams, um, helping them to be more effective, whether it's a group of police sergeants and their command staff, or whether it's a corporate uh, uh, executive team or a, or a a divisional or departmental team. I also do work in long-term healthcare and have learned a great deal there. About 14 years, I've done a year-long leadership academy in long-term healthcare, uh, nursing homes, assisted living, um, home health, um, in partnership with care providers in Minnesota. Um, in the last few years, a big part of this work has become focusing on these capacities in various ways. These are human capacities that we all have. The capacity for moral motivation, the capacity for moral clarity, and the capacity for moral courage. <clears throat> moral motivation is pretty fundamental. Um, no one goes to a rotary club and commits the kind of time and energy that you commit without demonstrating a level, high level of moral motivation. 
You care about right and wrong. You care about making the world a little better place. You care about building strong relationships with people and you vote with your feet. So I'm preaching to the choir here. And yet I also understand that in this time of tribalism, in this time of fractionalization, sometimes our moral motivation isn't evenly distributed. And we have to remember that we owe duties to people to whom we disagree as well. And there are benefits to finding ways to listen and connect across these boundaries as well. I also don't need to tell you, in addition to this motivation, there's moral clarity. This is more head work. What is the best choice? How can we talk about the best choice? And again, Rotary offers a distinctive and unique. I was unfamiliar with the fifth test of is it fun? <laughs> this is new to me. What are, and am, am I okay on my marks? I don't want to be yeah. off. All right, is that good? Okay. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? In fact, I'm not making this up. I put a slide in here, right here, right? I mean, you have contributed a tool for moral clarity to the world and apparently improved it locally with a fifth test. <laughs> this, is, this is grounded in the experience of a business person, um, but it is consistent with moral theory theories as well right? It is consistent with theories of moral character, theories of our duties to one another, and outcome-based thinking, consequentialism, and so forth. It's a powerful tool for moral clarity, and a lot of its strength comes from the idea that you understand that it is not merely about knowing what is ethically permissible, what's authorized. It's about making the best choice. And it's about thinking creatively and discerning what is the best choice. And a lot of my work, the majority of it in this area, I certainly teach a lot of ethical decision-making, moral clarity. We talk about reinforcing and maintaining moral motivation, but sometimes we care what's right and we know what's right and it's still hard and it's still scary to do what's right. And that's when we need to draw on this third capacity, moral courage. Courage is a character trait. All over the world, interestingly, in, in, um, in the tribes in coastal South Africa, like the Kosa, in uh, India, in classical society in India, um, in China, in Confucian and Taoist society, and in ancient Greece, cultures recognized that if we want to be strong as a society, we need to create character traits and mechanisms for building character traits in our people that help us help them to be their best in our society. And courage is a universal or seems to be a nearly universal trait that whatever system I have had the privilege of learning about one of the character traits that makes us successful as people is the character trait of courage. It's the capacity to do what is right in the face of fear, in the face of adversity. And the good news is, as a character trait, we can develop it. We can develop it like we would develop a muscle. I want our mu my muscles to be strong so they can do the job. Likewise, in the case of a great threat or a great fear, I want strong moral courage. I want flexible muscles and courage because I don't know where the threat's coming from. And we need endurance because it's rough out there. And sometimes the challenges are long-term, not short-term. And so I wanna talk and engage you in talking about things that specifically, not things, practices that specifically develop moral courage. And I wanna liken them to integrity. When I use the word integrity, what comes to your mind? And if you're on Zoom, feel free to uh, use the chat or unmute and speak up. Anyway, when, when I say integrity, what does that mean to you? A man, a man or a person of the word, right on. Oh, right on. What's that? Trustworthy. Trustworthy, good. Others? Anything? Dependable. Pardon me? Dependable? Excellent. High morals. High morals? Mm -hmm. Honest. Honest, honesty, absolutely. We're, we're all in the same ballpark, the same neighborhood, right? I want to introduce another concept too. 
Let's liken moral integrity to structural integrity. If a building has structural integrity, it can be set, it, it, it stands up to the stresses it was designed for. It stands up to the weather and the wind and the load and time. And if we have moral integrity, we are able to act in accordance with our values in the face of the stresses we were designed for. Now, as with the structure, there are potential failure points. We can think about the tragedy of the 35W bridge collapse, starting with some gusset plates that held structural members together. If the engineers had known, right? If they had known, they could have changed out, reinforced those, those plates, watched them for stress and so forth. Likewise, if we are serious about building our integrity and maintaining our own strength, we need to be thoughtful first about what are our potential failure points. Another way to look at that, what are our moments of truth? What are our moments of truth? You have a cards on your table, a half sheet of paper. I'd like everyone to grab one. This is gonna be an anonymous exercise. Um, but I'm gonna ask everyone to write down and I'm gonna collect and read some, we'll read them. What is a moment of truth for you? It's anonymous because I don't know whose is whose, right? And I don't know any of your handwriting. So what is a moment of truth for you? And while you're writing, I'm gonna share a couple for me. My clients ask me for advice and let's be honest, sometimes they don't wanna hear it. If I have to, if I have a client who is relying on me to be an advisor and they don't want to hear what I believe is my best advice, that scares me. And 15 years ago, that scared me because I was afraid I wouldn't have clients and I would not, I would, my business would fail and I'd lose my house and, you know, I would die alone in the dark. I'm not so afraid of that anymore. Business is good. I've been very fortunate. Very fortunate. I've also lost clients because they didn't like my advice. And you know what? It was always for the best. It really was. Because if, if, they, if we were not aligned in that way, I shouldn't be their advisor. But yet the fear has not gone away. I don't like making people unhappy. I don't particularly like conflict. And I don't like being wrong. And if someone who I like and respect believes something and I believe something different, there's a probability I'm wrong too. It's still not easy. That for me is a moment of truth. Here's another moment of truth. And this is more embarrassing. I have real difficulty delivering written work on time. I am perfectionistic. I am slightly overcommitted much of the time. And yet I'm, I, I make a commitment to a client to deliver a report, a letter, a proposal, and I struggle to deliver those things on time. This is a deep problem for me. And it, is, it has become a moment of truth. It's a moment of truth when the deadline is approaching. It's a moment of truth when I consider my workload and the phone rings and someone says, could you fit in a project in May? And if I say yes, it's gonna put other current commitments at risk. Those are moments of truth. I'll give you a little more lighthearted, but no less sincere. I'm trying to commit to physical fitness. My habits run prominently toward the couch and potato chips. My vision has to be consistent with the exercise cycle, the running shoes, the kettlebells, and salads, and lean protein. I'll tell you, I do a lot of work in public safety. I'm driving, if I'm driving home from a police station at one o'clock in the morning, a white castle looks like a cathedral to me. <laughs> <laughs> one parking lot is the moment of truth. If there are two entrances, two moments of truth. That's how weak I am sometimes, right? It's a moment of truth, right? So let me collect the cards if, if you could, if you could, if you have them. And if we don't have them, that's, I'll give you another minute. People are still writing. I'll give you a minute. The question is, what is a moment of truth for you? What is a moment that requires moral courage? For example, giving someone advice they don't want to hear or.
Right. Mix these up in case someone was watching the order with which they were picked up. I have the utmost respect for your privacy. Working with my personal beliefs versus those of business and customers. The return to work versus working from home. Two very good examples. It feels good to work in your jammies. It just does sometimes. And that's not necessarily the best choice, right? Doing a hard thing the right way when no one is looking. You don't want to disappoint. Consistency in commitments. Being consistent and recognizing that we're developing habits. Here, a moment of truth is faith in Christ Jesus as your savior, all the rest of living in society will follow. Income tax time. <laughs> CPAs need eight hours of ethics training every three years. If ever there was a negotiated settlement, that's it. And I provide some of that training. Sometimes incrementally in firms, they'll hire me to come in and do a customized thing. Sometimes the Minnesota Society for CPAs hires me to do an eight hour session. They get really booked the month before the deadline, right? And there is a fine line between an ethics training and a hostage situation. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> a moment of truth. When I learn that someone is not trustworthy and I must walk away, absolutely. A moment of truth. How to accept LGBT-oriented people. Very personal. What is a moment of truth is when I'm asked to share my faith. Deciding between allocating more time to work and my family obligations. Huh. A wife's changing health into a wheelchair and losing a job. This is one of those where our moral courage has to have endurance, doesn't it? It's a long-term challenge. And procrastination, amen to that. I want to thank you all for being so candid and, and, and taking that exercise so seriously. Um, that's an act of moral courage because you know one another. I bet some of you know, know of whom I spoke. Um, this is the first, one of the first steps and it's an ongoing step to maintaining and building that structural integrity. Because it's one thing to say, I want to be more morally courageous. That's nice. Then I really engage with what are my moments of truth. And I have to develop a vision. And this is a critical step. I want to create a vision. I want to be a person who. I want to be a person who. In each of these statements, and for those of you who still have cards, um, I want to be a person who. You know, completing that sentence, completing that sentence, and there's more than one answer. Completing that sentence, I want to be a person who, who faithfully represents their faith. I want to be a person who um, maintains that faith. I want to be a person who makes the right choices at tax time. I want to be the person who puts family first without violating my obligations to my business associates, right? I want to be the person who um, makes the right choice, whatever it might be with respect to working from home in some contexts and working in public in other contexts. I want to be the person who, because this gives us a vision. And with this vision, I can start to see the moments of truth coming. In fact, I can start to see them as points of inflection. And that, together with reflection, gives me an, a, a, an opportunity to manage this cycle. This cycle happens in our life whether we manage it or not. I mean, it's fairly clear that our character largely drives our actions. If we are generous, we will tend to act kindly. If we are faithful, we will tend to act faithfully. If we are squared away and disciplined, we will tend to be reliable, right? But how did we get faithful or generous or squared away? Well, we become what we do over time. 
We don't become what we merely intend to do. I can prove it. My intention to work out yesterday had no impact on my physical fitness because I didn't do it. <laughs> this morning, I got on the bike. I got out the kettlebells. I hit it hard. That will have an incremental effect. First of all, on my physical state, but also on my capacity to do it again tomorrow and the next day, right? This cycle works whether we work it or not. Nobody holds a little baby in their arms and says, you're going to be quite a shoplifter one day. <laughs> and yet people do go down that path. Yes, sir. Well, that's the question I, when I heard you tell us talking about the good things that we do that lead to good in actions. You didn't say anything about the bad things we do that lead to bad actions and that you don't make the cycle any different to that, but maybe you do. And I want that. I, want that, uh, I, be I believe that the cycle, I believe, and I'll, I'll talk to you about how we change it. Inflection and reflection. If I have become a thief, I need to I need to wish to cease to be a thief by one means or another. If I if I have fallen into a habit of lying to aggrandize myself, to advance my business because I'm insecure, because whatever, for whatever reason, if I've fallen into a habit, I need to develop a vision that says I want to be a person who tells the truth, even when it's difficult. I am at risk for I am always at risk for failing to honor my business commitments, which is a bad thing. When it's written work, not generally, but particularly when it's written work. And I mean, that's not the same as shoplifting, but it's not honorable, right? And so the first step is I recognize and commit. And I say, I want to be a person who honors his commitments. And now I, and if I had the habit of, of stealing, I would use the same process. And I have done work in jails and I have done work, um, um, uh, and, and one of the areas I am interested in it very much right now is second choice and second chance employment. I believe that with a high level of pressure and support, second chance employment has benefits across society. But it's going to require a lot of this. It's going to require high pressure and high support to help people who want to make this change, right? So, in, and I'm not doing any work in there yet, but I'm working on it. I, that's, that's, I'm very interested in it. Inflection. This is the point between my habit, stealing, lying, procrastinating, perfectionism, and my vision. I want to be a person who. We have to be, become adept at seeing those points of inflection, just like I see the parking lot of the White Castle, right? This is a choice. I also know I'm not going to be perfect. And so what I, the first art is the vision. The second art is, and remembering that, the second art is getting good at seeing. This is a point of inflection for me, habits or vision. And if we start to see that, the world gives us a curriculum to learn from, right? We're going to get a lot of choices, right? A lot of choices. If inflection points happen, reflection points require a discipline and a habit to create. And if you engage in a, in a process of daily reflection, don't substitute what I'm going to recommend for what you're doing now. What you're doing now is probably better. But I will say this. Most people, myself included, up until a while ago, don't have a process of daily reflection. And that's a missed opportunity to reinforce integrity and moral courage. So what's the minimal reflection? This is my proposal to you. Set a timer on your phone for, or an egg timer for three minutes. That way with a timer set, you don't have to think about time. This is what you're doing for three minutes. It allows you to focus entirely. And focus on your points of inflection in the past day. What, what good choices did you make? What bad choices did you make? What, let me put it another way. Where did I act consistent with my vision and where didn't I? Now, we are not teaching our head anything. Your head was there all along. What we are teaching is our heart. We are teaching our heart what our head knows. And that takes time. And we want to draw on the benefits of positive emotion. And so 
when you feel, when you fail to live up to your vision, it's okay to feel a little rotten about that. It's okay. Don't get stuck there, but feel it. And when you do right, and this is harder for most of my clients because they say, well, of course I'm right. It's my job. But when you do right, pause to feel a little good about that. Because again, it, not because that's nice, because it teaches your heart. I mean, Immanuel Kant wrote, who was as in his head as any philosopher in Western history. He was as big a belief in the power of rationality as any philosopher I've read. And he believed that the emotions can contribute to our moral development. If we allow ourselves to feel good about doing right, as well as bad about feeling wrong, doing wrong. And if you come to a day where you've got nothing, don't, don't take a day off. Pause for three minutes to reflect on gratitude. I have been doing this in part because I'm writing a book on it, and it'd be really hypocritical to advocate something I don't actually do. <laughs> That's where I find the discipline someday. Like, how big a lout do I want to be when your business is called Ethical Leaders in Action? You know, loutishness is not desirable. Um, it's made a huge difference. And it's made a difference for many of my clients. It's made a difference for my kids. I mean, it, it is because I, because they're intimate in sharing with me the difference. It doesn't make hard things easy, but I find that I do a lot more hard things than I would have done that I did before. And I, I fail to live up to my expectations much less than I did before, right? Much less. And so this process of Building integrity is really like watching the bridge, doing maintenance on the bridge, reinforcing what needs to be reinforced. Who do I want to be? Can I see the points of inflection where there's a question between my habits and my vision? And will I engage in a process of learning from that incrementally on a regular basis? One of the key things to remember is that integrity does not require us to be perfect. In fact, the desire to be perfect is a barrier to integrity. It makes us brittle instead of flexible. It makes us willing to give up instead of return to trying. Moreover, if we were perfect, it would be pretty hard for us to lead others. Our, our, our fallibility gives us a basis for empathy. Our fallibility makes it easier for us to connect with others and for others to connect with us. But we don't want to let ourselves off the hook. Mistakes are a special case for character development if we do it right. See, if we're terrified of making a mistake, what happens? If you've worked in environments where people were terrified of making a mistake, they don't do anything. What else bad happens? They lie about their mistake. They lie about their mistake. That's exactly right. I'm working with a professional right now who is about to lose their license because they were promoted. Good person, honorable person, but their boss said, if you screw up one more time, we're gonna demote you. He really, really, really couldn't tolerate the idea of being demoted. And he made a mistake and he lied about it. And that's that. And there are some mistakes we can't recover from. So in the face of that, and, and as I work with, EMS responders, they say, you know, you could talk about making mistakes with class, but the truth is our mistakes are life and death. I say, absolutely. That's all the more important that you learn to learn from those mistakes, right? Making a mistake with class means owning it, learning from it, and then forgiving yourself and getting out with your life. Yes. I want to have a special piece with rationalization. Rationalization. You rationalize all of the mistakes you made into somehow you justify it. That's right. That that would be a key barrier to making your mistake with class. That's right. If you can't, if you rationalize it, that is a psychological um, slip from owning it. It's exactly right. And if we can see it, we can work on it. If I own it, I accept responsibility. I try to fix what I broke if I can or mitigate the harm that I've done. And if there are legitimate consequences, I accept those consequences with grace, right? If I've owned it, then I got to learn from it. Where did I fall down? You know, what was, was it a process of self-deception or rationalization? Was it a lack of information? 
Was I being selfish instead of generous? Where did I fall down? If you lead a team, you can ask yourself these four questions. If my team continues to make a mistake, am I asking them to do the right thing? Process. If I'm asking them to do the right thing, are they prepared to? Are they trained and able to do it? They have the capability. If they have the capability, do they have the resources, the tools, the time, the people? And if those three lights are green and the mistake recurs, maybe I don't have the right people in the right role, but I'm gonna ask that question last because I wanna give people the benefit of the doubt. So the process of learning can be an analytical process. It could be very quick indeed. You could know right away. And I know why I made that mistake. I, uh, for the first part of my presentation of the high school students uh, at Rotary Maple Grove Saturday morning, I didn't live up to my own expectations in presenting. I was scattered. I had the wrong PowerPoint up. It was sloppy. And I've been doing this a long time and they deserve my best game. And I look and I say, well, I tried to get a workout in right beforehand. Um, I uh, rushed in, logged in, had to reset my router. I know why I made that mistake, because I didn't do what I know how to do as a professional to prepare for a professional presentation. I learned from that. Actually, I apologized to them for it and used it to teach making mistakes with class. Hey, you guys just saw me make a mistake. Here's what I learned from it. I know why I made the mistake. And I move on, right? We move on. Doesn't mean we forget necessarily, but we forgive ourselves and we get on with our lives. We don't relive the mistake. We don't define ourselves in terms of the dumbest thing we ever did, right? We move on. This allows us to use mistakes to build integrity. And I've got one more thought for you today. Before we, oh, that's me. Come on. There we go. The other critical factor that builds, builds integrity, that builds moral courage is relationships. I can't see when I'm, I can't always see when I'm screwing up. If I have people in my life who trust me, who I trust, who will call me on it, they make me a better person. If I have to have a difficult conversation with someone, it's easier if I have a relationship with them in advance. These relationships matter a lot. And one of the places where I saw this most dramatically is in the world of hospice. Um, home health hospice workers. I, I had the privilege and opportunity and challenge of helping both of my parents and two of my grandparents at the end of their lives. And all of them were in hospice. And something remarkable happened each time. When we went from sort of regular standard cure, curative home health to hospice home health, I went from being the taskmaster manager to being a client and being cared for because these folks took care of stuff. And I became very curious professionally about what I was seeing. And one of the features that home health hospice workers have, they meet once a month to grieve together. They have a, a peer led process where they reflect on the people who have passed in their care, which is about a hundred percent, right? <laughs> And so they've become very adept. And in those, in those holistic, spiritual moments, they also connect at a human level that affects them operationally as well. And so the last bit of advice I have to you is something that will come as no surprise to Rotarians. What you're doing is the right thing. You are building relationships. You are building goodwill and better friendships. And this counts. So it's a privilege for me to be with you today. We have time for questions. I have a question. How do you handle high level public officials in my, and I'm just the antithesis of what you're talking about? I mostly grind my molars down and swear into my pillow. <laughs> and I, and, and um, uh, I, I, there aren't good answers. I don't have good answers. Um, political action, I mean, you know, the ballot box matters. I have worked. I made the mistake of believing that there was a tighter intersection between politics and justice than there was. And I was watching some local officials acting really dishonorably, really dishonorably. <clears throat> and I wondered there must be some recourse. So I talked to the time the Secretary of State was a friend and a 
former client. And I reached out to him. Uh, it was Mark Ritchie. And, and, and Mark said, I got news for you. The power flows from the people through the ballot box to the elected officials. And if they've broken laws, they can be held accountable just as any other citizen can. And if they haven't, the power flows from the ballot box to the elected official. It's troubling sometimes. I don't have a good answer. I can say that I try to be as persuasive as I can toward those with whom I can influence not to do that, but I haven't been very successful because the people that, the really good people who run and serve for the right reasons already know that, right? We have a question online. Please. Dr. Weinstein, um, I was struck early in your comments, uh, you referenced the dilemma about using the word tribalism. It occurs to me that maybe a place to open up that discussion is to use positive tribalism and negative tribalism. Oh, I like that. I'm gonna play with that. I thank you. That's a very good suggestion. Absolutely. Because we really can look at all the positive attributes of tribes per se and communities per se. That's great, thank you. I love that. Yes. Let's just go down the tribalism path for a little while and go back to the Civil War, where we had maybe as bad, maybe worse, maybe not as bad of a tribalism going on. And somehow they got out of it and it took 40 years. Yeah. Wandering in the wilderness. Yeah. Uh, thoughts? Um, one thought is it's easier to change laws than to change beliefs. And so the laws changed well before the underlying beliefs did. And they, those beliefs, some of those beliefs continue to change and evolve over time. And so that's the, the first thought that comes to my mind. The other thought that comes to my mind is the segmentation in the Civil War was neater because it followed political lines. Our segmentation is messier. I mean, in Minnesota, you, um, you can predict the voting um, often by whether there are sidewalks in the district or not. That's harder than this state believes that and this state believes this. So I think in some ways we're in a tougher spot than we were in the Civil War. I mean, for non-enslaved people, we're in a tougher spot than we were in the Civil War. Yeah. Is there any chance you can go back to the slide with the, where the close down cap? Uh -huh. Oh. I'm gonna have to bring it back up. Oh, okay. So don't worry about it. It's just it's the whole slide about um, where you added inflection and reflection, but it was I remember what character and action. Character and action. And I can I anyone please feel free to shoot me an email and please feel free to share my email address and I'll send you the slides. I'm happy to do that. Just gotta, just go back oh yeah, go back. No, it's frozen. That's not good. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Right there, right there. Thank you. Um, and the reason I bring this up is, um, and I know that you were starting with morality, um, but working with kids who were in um, labeled juvenile delinquents and were, you know, for them, their character was and their morality was was to be a good cook. Right. And their actions. And so it supported that they, you know, as being part of a game or being part of whatever is there's morals, there's values. You, I mean, the whole thing works. And, and so the reason I say that, and this is my political statement is right now we're into what do we do to change the crime rate? And part of it is we've just got to be tougher on them. More so than we've got to try and help people understand why it is that they choose that way to live. And so I don't know that I have a question as much as that works to reinforce people who are making decisions that fit their morals and fit their integrity. My integrity is I want to be able to get in and out of your car the best as possible. And if we do 15 cars that night, I'm damn good at it. So it reinforces that. It may not help everybody right. or the people whose car was broke into, but it helps those who believe in that lifestyle. So I, um, I guess I don't know what to say with that. Other than I think it works both ways. It doesn't just work for those behaviors that help larger society. How about those that help different or even our comments about, well, 
everything's best because the civil war is over. There's people who believe the civil war is still a story. Right. How, right. Do, how do you understand it from their point of view? I guess is well. And there are people who, who make a compelling argument, Brian Stevenson among them, that slavery didn't end, it evolved, right? And so on both sides, I, 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 lots of perspectives on that. But um, yes, and that's why there's a, that's why this is a three, the model is moral motivation, moral clarity, and moral courage. And I would argue that there's a fundamental lack of moral clarity in the person who honors uh, carjacking. I mean, and, and I would argue I'm not a relativist in the sense that, you know, you would ask him, um, do you carjack anybody? <laughs> or do you carjack people who are outside of your moral community? Right? And so you can, you, you can show that, that through moral clarity and moral motivation, not merely moral courage, you're right. It, those can be shown to be self-defeating. And they are self-defeating. The mortality rate among people who carjack is very high. It's terrible. Yeah. Far, we just want to <laughs> say thank you so much for being here today. Um, we first have a rotary thank you. coin. Thank you very much. <laughs> Keep that. Thank and you then very much. we also make contributions to Rotary Woods and Rain Garden on behalf of our speakers. So, yes. I'm honored by that. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, yes. Enjoy this presentation. And thank we'll you. be sure to get um, his PowerPoint out to the members as well. Next week, we have Jonathan Turner, who's going to be here from the Airport Foundation of the Minneapolis St. Paul Airport. So look forward to having everybody back here again. Great to see you all. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>